Okay, hello everyone. <clears throat> Thank you very much for joining us today. So, uh, just uh, we start off some housekeeping. Uh, today we have Mr. Patrick Bedford. We are very pleased to have him uh, in our e seminar series in translational biomedical engineering. He's a Canadian regulatory expert and uh, he's talking about uh, uh, the regulatory issues <coughs> and uh, augmenting. Uh, uh, regulatory affairs in Canada and in, uh, and other parties. So, in, if you have any question, please ask your question in the Q and A box. It's right uh, on the bottom of your uh, screen, and then in the chat box, uh, you can also communicate with the, uh, with others. And uh, there is a survey or poll that you can take it on uh, about the quality and uh, the organization of the T seminar series. Uh, this this will help us to improve. And uh, if you have any comments, also you can also uh, you know send us a message or email. We have a great line of speakers for uh, for the winter time, as as you can see, and you already uh, you know uh, you know saw this flyer on our uh, Twitter channel. So please uh, hang on and uh, you know uh, follow this uh, follow these uh, uh, future presentations too. Uh, next speaker, uh, we are very pleased to have uh, Professor Peter uh, Zanstra from uh, UBC, University of British Columbia, and uh, he, he's talking about the stem cell technology and the, uh, the, the, the progress and the advances that uh, he had uh, uh, during the past years. And uh, as always, we would like uh, to ask you to follow us on Twitter to get the most updated uh, uh, you know, program and the the the, the events that we, we have for for future, and uh, and also we would like to thank our sponsors, uh, uh, Montreal Transmit Tech Institute, who helps us to uh, keep running this uh, e, e seminar series. So, by that, without further ado, I do, I would like to introduce uh, Mr. Patrick Bedford. Uh, um, uh, Mr. Bedford is uh, an experienced and certified regulatory professional who is focused on uh, facilitating global regenerative medicine developments in Canada. He now leads an emerging regulatory consulting company, company that provides regulatory planning, interaction, and submission services. Prior to incorporating his own company, Patrick developed regulatory consulting services for a national center for excellence focused on regenerative medicine called CCRM, planned two Canadian CAR T new drug uh, submissions for uh, Celgene and uh, Inc. and uh, led teams at Health Canada responsible for developing guidance for uh, biosimilars, transplant materials, and cell and gene therapy. While leading these policy initiatives at Health Canada, Patrick uh, supported the, their Therapeutic Product Classification Committee, chaired the Cell, Tissue, and Organ Classification Committee, and, the, uh, and championed the International Harmonization Initiatives. He remains an uh, active member of the ISCTNARAC and Health Canada Cell Therapy Stakeholder Group. Patrick completed an honors bachelor of health sciences degree at the University of Western Ontario, a master's degree in bioethics and uh, health law at the University of Otago, and obtained a regulatory affairs uh, certificate from the Regulatory Affairs Professional Society. Uh, by this, I would like to invite Patrick to share his screen, and uh, the virtual floor is yours, Patrick. Please go ahead. Great. Thank you for the introduction. And Sorry about the acronyms. Uh, it's a hazard of regulatory affairs. If I do that at all today, let me keep me honest. Let me um, let me spell it out if it's not familiar. Um, I'm gonna double check. You can see my screen. See my my visual right now and, and hear me. I'm gonna set up. Great. I'm just setting up my screen right now. You should be able to see a presentation deck that uh, is going to kick into full screen in just a second. Yes. Now it's full screen. Perfect. Then maybe I'll get started. Yes. Um, great. Well, first of all, thank you, Human and Mosen, for organizing these e seminar series. And thank you to the coordinators and uh, the sponsors for your time and effort. I know these take a lot of a lot of um, effort coordinating and putting them together and organizing speakers. And uh, I, I want to follow up what a lot of speakers have said on these and say thank you because these these seminar series are really helpful, uh, particularly 
when, um, when we want to stay connected and a lot of us aren't going into the workplace. So I'm, I'm continually learning by listening to the researchers that you have here. So thank you very much. And I'm quite flattered to be amongst those speakers. I mean, you mentioned Peter Zanstra and other um, giants in their field, and I, I have a lot of respect for them. So I'm happy to speak on behalf of the regulatory field, which is much smaller, um, and, and provide what I can to this group and, and contribute. Um, I also appreciate the opportunity to get out of my pajamas and find out my suit doesn't fit anymore because I've been quarantined for too long. So um, I understand much of your audience are uh, academic startup oriented. And I just have to say, I wish that these, um, these series, this, these, these presentations were around when I was still studying. The practical insights you get while you're learning are so important. And uh, as you'll see, I've worked in, in, and you heard from Human, I, I've worked in industry, I've worked in government, and my favorite space, the most exciting space is working with academics and startups. So I'm really happy to speak to this group. Um, I'll be speaking directly to you brilliant uh, scientists and clinicians, and I wanna convince you not to give up and throw in the towel when you get frustrated um, with the unfamiliar world of regulatory, regulatory affairs, the regulatory concepts, pathways, terminology, and requirements. So that's one of my major goals. Um, uh, Human went over my presentation, but I want to talk a bit about how I got in my field. You might be interested in regulatory affairs. Obviously, I have a multidisciplinary background with an interdisciplinary master's degree, and I didn't know what to do when I wanted to when I when I was ready to graduate. Um, and I was lucky. I reached out to Health Canada, and I, um, uh, I I got a job working with the regulator. And I look at it as a 10 year uh, PhD in regulatory affairs. It's, I know there's a difference. I know that it's not uh, an academic PhD, just the amount of time and focus that I've had to develop a guidance for biosimilars, transplant material, cell therapy, clinical trial applications. Um, I've learned a lot and I'm happy to share that. Um, and my, I, I'd like in my early career path, for those of you interested in, uh, in regulatory affairs, I'd, I'd say, um, my career path is a lot like Plinko. Um, Plinko, for those of you not familiar, was a price is right thing. You drop a little chip down and gravity pulls it and it bounces around on pegs until it gets down to the bottom. And I feel like that's what I kind of did, especially early in my career. I didn't have a plan to get into regulatory affairs. Um, and and this is just where I ultimately ended up. Um, my, my career path has been a little more strategic since then. But uh, for any of, these, any, any of those of you who are interested in regulatory affairs, I'd encourage you to get into it. It's really interesting. I used to think it was a bit of paper pushing, um, and, but really uh, it, it leverages some of the things that I love and work on. So I'm motivated by health sciences and problem solving and communications. And I think that's really what regulatory affairs is. It's understanding what some brilliant scientists and clinicians have done and then packaging it together and communicating it to a regulator. So that's what uh, regulatory affairs is in a nutshell. And I'll, I'll go over it a little bit more. Uh, if you don't mind, please allow me to tell you a bit about Weekend Reg. It won't take too long, but this is a company that's born out of the beginning of a pandemic, just like uh, um, the e-seminar series. Uh, I just incorporated last May. And our goal is to facilitate global regenerative medicine developments in Canada. So this is, uh, we're passionate about helping Canadian researchers and startups develop their plans for Canada and globally and to help global companies come to Canada. Canada is a really good place to do clinical trials for a number of reasons that I'd love to go into. Um, and I think we can really help people by helping them augment their translation plans. So that's orient them to the Canadian regulatory affairs, educate people with uh, basic workshops to have them understand the context, and then also to develop strategic plans. Um, I help support uh, interactions, so that's is issue resolution, and pre-submission meetings with the regulator. I'm primarily focused on uh, Canada and, and in interacting with Health Canada because I've worked there and I know it quite well. Um, and I really wanna help people accelerate their submissions. I have annotated templates based on 15 years of experience um, that can really help people get going and I can help write submissions and prepare them. Uh, so far we've been quite, quite successful in eight months. I think we've helped over a dozen researchers and startup companies um, either plan their clinical trial route speak with Health Canada and pre-submission meetings and, and actually submit their clinical trial applications and think beyond clinical trials. So that's just, uh, thank you for letting me take the liberty to talk about my company. Um, but today, uh, the goal is to have you leaving more optimistic about regulatory than when you came. And hopefully you'll also be encouraged to engage regulatory experts earlier in development um, and leave slightly more knowledgeable um, just because I'll cover some concepts that you may or may not be uh, familiar with. Um, I'll give my perspective on commercialization and where regulatory fits. I'll contextualize regulatory um, commercialization uh, concepts 
and talk a bit about uh, basic components of regulatory affairs. I'll demystify regulatory by showing some diagrams for how to visualize it. And then um, I'll, I'll start to answer common questions I've posed to myself and I have some slides to explain before I can start answering some of your questions. And I expect to fall a little short of time because I wanna leave time for you to ask your questions. So please take note while I'm going through this and uh, feel free to ask questions for clarification or just something that's been bothering you for a while to understand uh, about regulatory. I do have to say that I know this is biomedical engineering and some of you are interested in medical devices. I have some knowledge of that. Uh, my main area of expertise is in cell and gene therapy and in biotech drugs. So uh, adopting a positive perspective of regulatory affairs. But first I wanna start with commercialization. This means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. And I think uh, some people, and especially some in the academic community, have a negative connotation of this. They think commercialization, someone must mean that uh, you're trying to make money off of providing drugs to patients. And there, there, there is a way to do that, and I don't think there's anything wrong with it. But uh, what I mean when I say commercialization is really it's a path that uh, will lead you to getting to patients, whether you want to make a significant re reimburse, uh, uh, return on, on your investment or whether you just wanna make something that's cost effective and will help people. Um, I'm using commercialization to mean both of them. Um, and really this, this path to commercialization is lined with regulatory milestones. So I think that if you have a path, they're probably more like a maze of commercialization. Um, if you think of it, the cheese is the end goal, whether it's make money or get to patients or whatever. But along that maze, there's little hunks of cheese, little treats and, um, those will help make sure you're staying on the right path. And I think that some of those milestones um, are regulatory affairs goals. So having a meeting with Health Canada and getting positive feedback is adds value and it's a nice thing to say you're on track. Having a clinical trial application for your first in human is yet another thing that you can um, think about as another milestone on your path. Um, and multiple clinical trials are usually required to get to um, uh, market authorization, which is the end goal of regulatory affairs. Um, and so I've just kind of, that's why I'm using this diagram of a, a mice in a, in a maze to get cheese. And, uh, and just thinking about that metaphor, regulatory affairs is actually a useful tool that you can use. Um, but when I say regulatory affairs also within there, people have different understandings. Uh, some of my colleagues in regulatory say that regulatory affairs is a regulatory science. And uh, it's rules based and there's right or wrong answers and, and you have to follow a, a pretty well beaten path. And really to them, I say, that's boring. Nobody wants to do that. Um, it's, uh, it, it might work for some things like small molecule pharmaceuticals that are well established and there's a lot of guidance out there. But to me, and going back to what I like to do, solving problems, uh, communicating, things like that, I think that uh, it's more productive to think of regulatory affairs as an art that's based on communication, negotiation, uh, problem solving, and, um, and ultimately setting global goals and, and trying to um, satisfy different regulators uh, with the, the most efficient way possible. Uh, I think my perspective is born of having been in biologics all, all along, and, um, and that I, I, I truly love uh, doing that. So keep that in mind when I'm talking today, I really am a, a bit of a disenchanted regulatory affairs person who doesn't think that there's always just an automatic answer out there. I think in terms of uh, implications of decisions instead. So um, another thing to understand about regulatory affairs, you'll hear terminology like regulatory CMC and regulatory strategy or regulatory operations. And, and really um, all these are subcategories of regulatory affairs that people can specialize in. Uh, I think it's really helpful to think of regulatory affairs really as um, if you could split your brain in two, it's understanding the development of a product in terms of how it's manufactured and what it's used for. So the safety and effectiveness, the clinical side, so manufacturing and clinical. And um, the manufacturing component can be subdivided down into what materials you use, how you process it, um, under what conditions, uh, in what establishment, things like that. And all of those are very important um, to developing a safe and effective and a consistent product. Um, and that's a specialty uh, on its own. And then the other side of thinking about what combination of in vitro and in vivo studies do you need before a first in human? What kind of uh, trial design and first in human studies do you need to move to uh, later development? That's all kind of the regulatory clinical side. And then this all comes together with this concept of 
identifying critical quality attributes of a product and then trying to make those consistently. And uh, critical quality attributes are really understanding how your product's characterized and what it actually is and uh, how it might work with a mechanism of action for what you want. And then understanding that there are clinical implications, being able to measure the clinical implications of those. That's where they come together. So think about that when you think about regulatory. Always divide it out, but understand they're interrelated concepts. And that's where you get this idea of different regulatory activities where you go to pre-submission meetings, trial applications, market applications, and then post-market activities. And know that when you talk about any of those, you can still talk about the quality or the uh, clinical aspects uh, um, or components of those submissions. And then there's also these other concepts that you need. So really it is a bunch of complex ideas all mixed together. Uh, and this is how I visualize it and hopefully it's helpful for you. Um, and then just because I said I want to bring a positive perspective to this um, and building on my belief that regulatory is an art, uh, we have to remember that regulators need to balance access to therape therapeutic alternatives. Like regulators want you to get approvals for drugs. Um, they want to be an enabler, um, but they have to balance that against the, the potential risks of allowing access too soon. And when you don't know enough about your product and they could harm somebody. So in doing this, you can look at regulations as a, as a barrier or an enabler. And I choose to believe they're an enabler. I think they actually tell you how to develop a product. And there's a lot more out there when you're thinking about developing your product, if you know where to look. Um, outside of publications, sometimes they're on uh, websites for regulators, sometimes they're international, sometimes, but either way, they're, they're very informative, so that in that way they're helpful. And when they're written well, that's good regulations, um, they'll allow you to move forward at appropriate times. And when I say good regulations, really they're performance-based, so that means they're non-prescriptive, they don't say how to do something, they just say something that must, something must be done uh, and let you creatively think of new ways to do it. Uh, they're flexible. So they apply over time to novel products. That's really important for cell and gene therapies um, because some of these weren't envisioned when the regulations were originally uh, written and they're supported by policy. That means they're, they're predictable. Uh, a lot of uh, people say that regulatory uncertainty is holding back their investments in this space. Um, and that's because there's not a lot of policy yet, but there's starting to be some. And I think um, if, with the right people, you can actually turn what could be seen as a risk into an opportunity. So, in the right hands, good regulations will um, enable you to move forward. The, the, and, and I'll just use a quick analogy. Um, in order to play the game of football, you have to understand and agree to the rules. You have to understand there's a line of scrimmage and that you have to respect that rule. Um, and uh, we wouldn't say that the rules of football are, are restricting your ability to do things. They're actually enabling you to play the game. And I think regulations really enable people to play the game because they allow patients to trust um, drugs when they're approved. They've gone through a process and they've been vetted by a third party that's independent. And so uh, regulations are necessary. Um, the challenge is when people don't understand the rules of the game or they disagree with how those rules are being interpreted. So I, my answer is you have to become familiar with the rules and understand how to use them to your advantage. Um, and, and just to help you start to get to familiar, I've simplified Canadian regulations. Really, they tell you three things. The regulations or the act in Canada, the Food and Drugs Act, says that no one can manufacture a drug under unsanitary conditions and give them to people. So that, that kind of makes sense. It's performance-based. You, you can't make something that's uh, either you don't know what it is or it's not consistent or it's, it's got adventitious agents or things like that. It kind of makes sense. And, and when it comes down to it, that's how basic it is. You need to manufacture something that's safe to give to people, uh, especially when they're injected into people. Um, another requirement is that you can't misrepresent your product. So you have to have evidence to show that when you say you, someone should use this because it's safe and it does something good, safe and efficacious is what I would say, um, you have to have evidence to support it. So the regulations require that and spell out how to show that. And finally, the, the, the act says that Health Canada has the authority to make regulations to tell people how to show them these things. So when it comes down to it, Keep that in mind. Regulations are simple. They make you do three things. And whenever you're confused, go back to these three things. And um, that will help you interpret whatever problem you have and, and start to solve it. Now, <laughs> just a quick uh, word on navigating regulations for novel technologies. You're going to get frustrated. Um, I hope you like my cartoon artwork. Apparently, I've been inspired as a part-time home homeschooling uh, teacher for my seven and nine-year-olds. Uh, uh, but the, the point uh, to this diagram is that 
you need the right tool for the right job. And that doesn't always, always exist in this field right now. As I said earlier, some of these weren't envisioned when the tools were made. Um, so this diagram applies to regulators. Um, they have the Food and Drugs Act and regulations. That's the hammer. So everything they see are nails. And then you get these new advanced therapeutic products and that doesn't work perfectly. They need to be used differently or a new tool may need to be developed. So it applies to regulators, but it also applies to um, the regulatory experts that you choose to work with. Um, if you work with somebody who's worked in devices and have them try and help you navigate cell and gene therapy uh, submissions under the food and drug regulations, it's not gonna go well. So this is all about finding the right tool for the right job and understanding that with these novel technologies, you have to think creatively and understand if you need a new tool or if you should use your tool a different way. Okay, so hopefully you have a bit of a pause. Hopefully some of my positive perspective of regulatory has rubbed off on you a little bit. Um, it'll only carry you so far. You will need to do uh, some more and that's what we'll, we'll talk about now. So uh, identifying when and how to think about regulatory. You'll get a theme here and that's, I think you should start thinking earlier. So here you see, um, a crude commercialization pathway, which starts with a whole bunch of candidate products um, that you're working on in a lab. And then ultimately you find one that really is worthwhile and worth pursuing. And you call that a discovery and you disclose it to your tech transfer office. And then you'd start to work with them to patent it and protect it so that you can develop it um, without risking the fact that you're investing and someone else can just go and do it and, and take it from you essentially. So that's the first step of commercialization. Uh, and then it moves roughly, and this isn't always linear, linear or, or, or step by step, but you put together a strategic plan, you plan to uh, move it into a facility that will allow you to make enough of it and do studies uh, in animals and in humans. So that's the tech transfer and into a, a new environment that allows you to move forward. Then you develop it further, you optimize it, you find out how you can make something um, better and more consistently. And then you start thinking about, oh, well, I'm going to have to file this to a regulator. So you have an interaction, whether it's a pre-submission meeting or, or answering some questions. Then you file a regulatory submission, get approval, do some cost effectiveness modeling, figure out um, whether it would, the benefits would outweigh the risks and whether the money is worth it for that incremental benefit. And then you'd do some work to um, convince people to reimburse um, for it in the Canadian setting or to pay for it in, in other settings. So that's commercialization in a nutshell. But um, if you wait to engage, and a lot of people do this, they wait to engage regulatory expertise until right before they go for regulatory submission. So you have some interactions or maybe not even, and you just want to put together a clinical trial application. I would say you really miss an opportunity there and you incur some significant investment risks because you've already made strategic decisions that cost a lot of money to do certain studies. But if you find out that those weren't adequate or they were done under conditions that weren't adequate, you might have to redo those. And whether you're thinking of developing a company and doing it yourself, or whether you're planning to license it out to somebody else, um, that really changes the value proposition that you're talking about and the certainty. So I call that regulatory risk and there's a way to fix it. And I'm, I'm obviously biased about this, but I think people should um, engage regulatory expertise earlier. I call this the light touch regulatory approach, where you um, start to engage with regulatory experts to just provide insights into your strategic plan. Um, there may be some mechanisms that you need to know about. There may be some um, documents out there that help show you what others have done before you, things like that. So start involving regulatory people at the strategic planning stage of development, um, and then interact with them a bit more when you do check technology transfer to find out how comparable your products are. And if you have to think about um, the conditions under which you're going to be doing this and where you're going to be going. Do it again when you're going to be developing your product, get some insights into um, your product development from a regulatory perspective. Really involve regulatory people when you're ready to approach the regulator. They can help make sure that you're, um, that you're on the right track and that you ask the right questions and you get what you need uh, to advance things as much as you can. Um, you'll have heavy reliance on regulatory experts when you file your submission. But I suggest, unlike my last diagram where it was fully regulatory, I think that scientists, researchers, companies have, have to stay really involved in the regulatory submission as well. And then I think there's less regulatory into the um, health tech transfer, or sorry, the health tech evaluations and things. But uh, aside from uh, checking in to make sure that the indications that you're looking at uh, are appropriate. Um, and then there are still, and you'll see in another diagram I have later, other regulatory things that happen in post-market. But um, I hope you'll agree that this may be a, a better way to um, engage regulators throughout time. And I'd suggest it also might be cheaper, even though you're engaging people more often, 
um, it's lower cost when you engage somebody earlier in development and uh, the impact of, of the advice you might get is much higher. So that, that's a good thing. All right, so demystifying this a little bit more. Um, if you wanna visualize a regulatory submission or regulatory, what types of um, documents you have in regulatory, it's, it's really, it's, it's a bunch of uh, national and international interrelated. And don't worry if you can't read this, this isn't intended to be text that you can read. It's just a visual to say that regulatory affairs is a bunch of national and international uh, interrelated regulatory uh, frameworks and policies. And um, I have a picture of some of the Canadian documents here and really it's understanding how they fit together and knowing they exist in the first place and knowing where to find them. So that's a big component. Um, ultimately, when you have a lot of uh, evidence to support a clinical trial application, you have to start thinking about how you're going to be organizing those. So um, I'm going to introduce the common technical document or CTD triangle. This is an internationally um, agreed upon format for regulatory submissions that's managed by ICH or the International Council for Harmonization. Groups like uh, US FDA, European Medicine, Medicines Association, Japanese PMDA, um, Health Canada are all full members of um, ICH. And so the idea is that um, you can do less work to go to different jurisdictions. Um, the uh, triangle really has one module, module one that has administrative and regional information, but the rest of it is intended to be kind of a cut and paste um, to different jurisdictions. Uh, module two um, is really summaries of your manufacturing, non-clinical and clinical studies. And then modules um, three, four, and five, three is all your quality data, um, module four is all of your study reports from non-clinical um, studies. And then module five is all of the uh, clinical um, summary. So this is just a structure and, and, and it's best thought of as a, um, a folder structure with a bunch of documents in it. So you have a, a high level folder, there's different levels of granularity. The high level folder, there's five of them. And then within those there's subfolders and within those there's documents. So that's how to think about it. And I have a little bit of a file structure that I've just cut and paste on the right there, the typical uh, clinical trial application folders and files for Health Canada. I'll have another diagram that you can read a bit better in a minute. Um, for those of you who are frustrated because science is what matters and who cares about uh, formatting, I ask you to just try and read this paragraph, this short paragraph. Um, you'll see my point, and, and that's that anyone should agree that, that science supporting a product is what matters, um, but a new drug submission, for example, can be up to 500,000 pages of information, and it's dense information. Um, Regulators need to stipulate how they want the data so that they can assign chunks of it to different experts and then they can all wade through it and get back and decide what to do about a submission. Ultimately, um, you need to know and learn if you're going to be filing a, a regulatory submission or work with someone who can understand uh, how to follow these rules, these formatting rules. Okay, so here I've superimposed regulatory activities onto the commercialization diagram I provided before. Um, even though you may be focused on trials and most interested in clinical trial applications now, you need to start thinking from this life cycle approach and start thinking about future regulatory activities, whether it's because you're talking to venture capitalists to get investment and you have a bit of a timeline. Um, the more educated you are on these things, the better. So I'm just going to touch very briefly on it right now. I have a few, one slide for each of these in a minute, and then we'll get into some of the question and answer stuff. So um, you need to plan for your clinical trial application. You know this. The, you should be thinking about your clinical trial application while you're doing some tech transfer. You should start putting some documents together and understand what's involved in a clinical trial application um, well before you have regulatory interactions like pre-submission meetings. Um, and then that's, that's probably what you're most familiar with, but other regulatory activities include lot release. So when you have a clinical trial for a biologic, um, you don't just get the approval to move ahead with your trial while you're conducting your trial and every lot that you make from your manufacturing facility um, needs to be assessed. And then as a third party double check, you have to um, interact with Health Canada and they will tell you when you can release it. Um, for these types of products, a lot of times that will require you to send samples to Health Canada and they'll double check things. Uh, but sometimes it's just a paper um, exercise and that's based on how risky your product is and how likely it is that they can, uh, they can help do that function. Um, lot release is ongoing. Once you get your product approved, um, you will forever have to adhere to lot release requirements. Um, and because uh, you don't want, 
it needs to be risk appropriate. So Health Canada has different groups for products once they're on the market and they span from group one to four and uh, group one being high and group four being low risk products. And a group four would require just a paper-based um, fax back, a way of saying, this is what our, our product is. Can we release it? And they say, yes, sometimes you can release it. And then, uh, and then um, just tell them that you released it in your in your annual reports. Uh, but then lot one or group one would be you actually have to um, interact with them and wait to release it. So um, know that those um, systems exist. And then um, and then obviously what's a, a little better known is a new drug submission. And a lot of people know that that's the holy grail. When you fire file your new drug submission, you're done your clinical development, you're done your manufacturing development. Now you're going to find out whether you can. Um, administer it to patients or distribute it for administration uh, regularly. Uh, but I also want to remind you that this doesn't always end either. Any, manufa any manufacturing changes over time require supplements. Um, so if you make a major change to manufacturing that could have clinical implications, you have to file another submission and support that change. Also, if there's more safety information that's known about the product, you may need to tweak um, some of your documentation around it and warn clinicians, things like that. So this is all part of a life cycle approach that you need to be a little bit aware of, uh, at least just while you're speaking with people. So, you know, in the future, these are things that you'll have to do. Um, those are the submissions you have to, to the scientific review group at Health Canada that says, yes, you can use this clinical trial or you can conduct this clinical trial or you can use this product. But um, there's another type of regulatory submission you should be aware about. Um, and that is an establishment license. So this is a, uh, it's facility specific, so not product specific. So when you're using a new facility or if that facility has a new regulatory, uh, regula um, uh, yeah, an, an activity that's, that's regulated, you, they, you need to get an appropriate license. Um, this is different in different jurisdictions. So for example, in Canada, you have to think about making sure you use an establishment that's good manufacturing practices certified by Health Canada prior to distributing your drug for market use. Um, in the U.S., it's uh, required to register your, your establishment uh, if you're conducting trials there anywhere between phase two and beyond. And in the European Union, for example, you need to uh, have a qualified person certify your establishment as appropriate for clinical trials, um, even in phase one studies. So these are GMP specific, good manufacturing practice specific uh, requirements that you need to know about. Um, and then even later, you have to know that there's a uh, other regulatory um, uh, concepts like uh, patent linkage. Um, so Health Canada won't approve a drug um, if it references or infringes upon a patent that's, that they have in their um, uh, list of patents. Um, and you need to satisfy that before you market them. There's also concepts like data protection and market exclusivity, which regardless of patent status, um, give companies who've invested into clinical trials a certain amount of time before anybody can reference their product um, to develop theirs or support their submissions. So there's lots to think about and even uh, regulatory concepts like pricing regulation are, are things that you, you can uh, start looking into earlier. So I said, I'll go over some of the kind of more practical details of, of what I just talked about. And one of the regulatory mechanisms um, that people are interested in is a pre-submission uh, meeting with regulators. And um, this is before you file a CTA with Health Canada or an IND, an investigational new drug submission with the FDA. Um, you can speak with the regulator and get some insights into whether your design is appropriate, whether you have adequate preclinical evidence to support it, um, and uh, the manufacturing is acceptable. Um, these are kind of the, this was a, a big piece of cheese in the maze. Is, is, it a, regular, is a successful pre-submission activity is actually very valuable to you. Um, so just to break it down, or a pre-submission activity really starts with a request and then for the meeting, and that should be done about three months in advance in Canada and in the US. Um, it's provide briefing materials that regulators can review uh, to have an informed discussion with you. And there will be some uh, five to 10 questions that you put in that briefing book for the regulator to consider. A lot of times you get um, written feedback, which is really helpful. And then you have the meeting and then you have the meeting follow up. So um, when you think about this timeline, plan to have three to six months, um, three months to have the meeting and to prepare for it and get there. And then a little bit of time to follow up um, with meeting minutes and things like that. It's so probably a four month effort. Um, but then 
if you're thinking about filing a clinical trial application after, give yourself enough time to listen to their feedback, make changes before you file that. So there's a bit of the mechanism for meeting with them, some of the activities you need to do and a timeline. Um, and I guess this is a, a closer visual. I told you my last one wasn't too legible, it was too tiny, but when you visualize a clinical trial application, I'm back to the, the common technical document, you're going to have to use that kind of filing structure. A clinical trial application in Canada can be done through a, a special formatting called um, the electronic CTD. So that's where you have uh, an XML backbone and it's like a program and you submit it through a common uh, electronic submissions gateway for the FDA and, and Canada. Uh, but you can also just zip this into a folder and email it to Health Canada. It's quite uh, relatively simple compared to a new drug submission. The Canadian clinical trial application is really three folders. The first folder contains some subfolders, but ultimately about 15 Canadian specific documents and forms. Um, the documents, a lot of them are short, the forms, things like that, four to five pages, but it also contains your investigator's brochure, your study protocol, and, uh, and, and some material like that, a, a summary of the safety and effectiveness information that you're submitting. Um, and those are formatted documents and they kind of form a to-do list for you. Uh, Canadian Submission also has uh, about a 40 to 80 page quality overall summary for a complex biologic uh, that summarizes your manufacturing. And then any additional manufacturing uh, information that you need to provide in the submission will fall into a module three within some sub um, folders or documents. So that's, if you're visualizing clinical trial application, that's about what it is. Um, the FDA one's not that different. And my main point here is you can almost cut and paste a lot of things from the Canadian submission to the US. Canadianizing a US um, IND doesn't take a whole lot of uh, change. It, it, there are some differences, um, but uh, it's quite possible. So the US um, IND is uh, really the same structured folder about 10 administrative documents are in module one. The same summary, the quality overall summary is in module two. Uh, there might be some nuances that Health Canada is interested in that the IND, that the US wasn't and vice versa. Uh, the US IND will probably contain some more uh, summaries about non-clinical uh, information and module three as required, just like in Canada. And uh, some non-clinical study reports will be provided to the US as well. Keeping in mind the relative difference between Canada's regulator and the US regulator is quite significant. Um, so Health Canada does require a few less documents, but we'll take 30 days to review a clinical trial application and it's a default approval if you don't hear back from them to say, no, don't start yet. And uh, the approval from a clinical trial application is a no objection letter. So it's not saying, yes, this is great. It's saying, yes, this, this looks reasonable. <laughs> um, okay, so that's the clinical trial application. And just by contrast, a new drug submission, if you wanna look at it, I have a folder structure here. There's a lot of um, folders that are condensed right now, but there's the five major ones and then some of the subheadings for them. Um, this will be provided in electronic common technical documents. So you'll probably require a regulatory operations professional to put this together for you um, and file it through the common electronic submissions gateway in Canada, um, which piggybacks on the US one. So it's the same kind of uh, format for submitting it. Uh, the NDS is different than a CTA because really it's not pass fail. This is, um, if you, you can get an NDS that's approved, but it's, it's really representing the culmination of your efforts and it will shape the product, uh, use over time. So you really want to get an optimal, uh, product monograph that, that means, uh, your labeling and your claims around it and things like that are, that are supported by all of the evidence you have are optimized and, and strategically chosen by, um, by whoever wants to market this. Um, this is much more detailed than a clinical trial application. It, it includes everything from your workflows and floor plans of your facility to comprehensive study reports and, and different summaries thereof. Um, so I just can't emphasize enough. It, it, the early first in human is one thing. You develop it in the later, which is a more complex submission, and then later studies, more complex submission, and ultimately your new drug submission is pretty, pretty substantial uh, endeavor. Uh, it takes a lot of time to put together. And it ultimately takes a lot of time for the regulator to review rather than 30 days, um, a new active substance, new drug submission that doesn't qualify for a special pathway will take 300 days for them to review. And uh, this cost of their efforts to do that is reimbursed. So whereas clinical trial applications have no direct costs uh, to, the, to the regulator, they have the indirect cost of resource to put together, but no direct cost. Contrast that to a new drug submission that costs about uh, $400,000 to submit it to Health Canada. Um, 
So this is a, a significant goal and where most people are aiming when they think about regulatory. Um, yeah. So now I guess I'll jump into some, some common questions. Um, and then that'll flow into any questions that you may have. So common questions, first of all, where do I start? Um, uh, here I've taken a little snippet. Don't worry about reading the documents. They're just to remind me to talk about <laughs> what I want to say. So uh, I've taken a, a research um, application, the application form for stem cell networks, uh, accelerating clinical translation program. You've, just to show you don't, you're not starting from nothing. You already have a plan. You, you know where you want to go. You've told whoever's funding your research or if there's venture capitalists or whatever, you've, you've put together a plan and said what you want to do. And now what you have to do is translate that plan into a more practical, how are you going to develop your product uh, for regulatory success? And there's two documents that I have a picture of here. One naturally is a quality and one is clinical. As I told you, it's really helpful to think of them as separate. Um, and I've developed these documents uh, in collaboration with Stem Cell Network uh, to provide for free to anybody who wants to use them. Um, they're annotated templates and they're intended to help you start thinking about how to translate your research plan into a regulatory plan. It's that in-between bridge. And the quality target product profile is quite unique, the one that I, we've put there, because it employs concepts of quality by design. I'd be happy to chat about that if you have questions, but um, that's intended to hopefully get you to start thinking longer term about your product uh, and to address some of the key risks for cell and gene therapies. And the target product profile is, um, I hope, pretty helpful. It's geared towards uh, cell and gene therapies, and I encourage people to use that as a good starting point to understand some of the concepts for regulatory and to start bridging your research plan into a regulatory plan. And then another question is, when should I speak with regulators? I get this a lot, and I have a rule. I have three rules. You need to do it when you need to. You should do it when you need to. You should do it when you're ready, and you should do it while you're still willing to listen. And I say that because I see a common mistake where um, people go to the regulator too early. They go when they don't have meaningful questions. They haven't done the research themselves. And even if you get the, the meeting with the regulator, you don't get the most out of it. And I would suggest you're wasting everybody's time. If the answer already exists, do a little work to get that answer and come up with a better question. So make sure you wait until, you're, um, until you need to and you have questions that you genuinely want to ask them. Another one is a common mistake is that um, you go before you have a plan. People expect to be able to go to the regulator and say, um, I'm, I want to do this. How should I do it? And um, that's not how it works. You need to have sufficient material saying that I have this plan. This is why I'm doing it this way. And then you can get some constructive feedback on that. And I have an example because another question will be about preclinical models. Um, and I'll illustrate how that can, um, how this is important. Uh, and I'd also say that a common mistake is that people wait too long to interact with the regulator. They invest in full GLP, good lab practices, um, studies and, and go ahead and they get all their results and then they, they go to talk to Health Canada because they're planning on filing a CTA uh, and then they find out their study, either the conditions weren't right, the endpoints weren't right, the number of animals, the animal model wasn't right, something like that. And now you risk redoing things. So if you follow these three rules, do it when you need to, do it when you're ready and do it while you're still willing to listen. I think you're setting yourself up for some success. And usually this is a, a reminder is if you want to talk to the regulator, plan three months in advance because that's how long they're booking out. And that gives you time to put together your materials and definitely six months prior to your actually ap actual application because that'll give you the time to have your meeting, get your feedback, address it, make changes, and then file your submission. Now, what animal model should I choose? This is probably number one um, that people ask. And it's frustrating and, and no regulator will answer this question. And I think for good reason, and I won't answer it either. What you'll get is it depends. And then you should know that there's many factors that influence what animal model you should use. And first is your product and the type of product and what others have done and things like that. Then your proposed indication, and then what other available evidence. It's not about just which animal model, it's what about um, all of your other in vitro studies and all of that. And, and what, what risks are you actually hoping to address? And, um, and how are you doing that? And it's up for you to put together and pose to the regulator, and then they'll give you feedback. Um, to do this, um, and the way you should start thinking about choosing your preclinical models is to think backwards. Um, you need to identify what your goal or your purpose is, how your product will be used. Start thinking about all of the different risks that, uh, that could happen 
then evaluate the likelihood of them, the seriousness of them, the ability to mitigate them, and then you set out to design a study or a combination of studies that will address all of those risks and inform them to give you confidence that you should move forward. This is a bit like um, the, the scientific method where you come up with a hypothesis of what it should do. You think about um, the risk of it not doing it, and then you set out to prove that it's not going to do what you don't want it to do. And then it's presenting it to the regulators. So that's how you should start thinking about how to choose your animal model. And uh, another note is just with uh, small molecule pharmaceuticals, a general rule is you had to plan to do a small animal model and a large animal model. Um, an international guidance document, one of the ICH documents, I think it was Q6B, but I'm not sure, um, specific to biologics suggests that uh, you should choose the most relevant animal model. So if you have an animal model of disease that also shows um, uh, where the product will go in the, it, it predicts where it might go in the human and things like that. that. That's what you have to start thinking about to choose a relevant animal model and more likely it'll be a combination of in vitro and in vivo studies. All right, another question is just when do I need to be GXP? So this is, uh, there's a lot of good documentation practices, GDP, good lab practices, GLP, good manufacturing practices, GMP, and good clinical practices, GCP. So um, just as a general rule, good documentation practice, you need to be GDP whenever you want someone to believe your notes. Um, that one's quite simple. Uh, the GLP is a little bit more complex. Um, you should conduct your preclinical studies in GLP facilities where you can. Um, these are much more expensive than just doing it in a lab. So um, you'll try and minimize the amount of GLP studies you want um, from a financial um, perspective. But uh, I'd say that a good general rule and what, what's uh, written in the clinical trial self therapy, the self therapy clinical trial application guidance is that your key safety studies um, will need to be done in a GLP facility. Uh, your key safety studies will be informed by a risk assessment. And you can also use available guidance documents like the self therapy clinical trial guidance says that uh, um, ectopic tissue formation, toxicity, um, uh, biodistribution, uh, persistence, and um, yeah, they, it lists out what some of the risks are. And so you have a good starting point, but really identify the risks. The high risks should be addressed in GLP labs because the regulator wants to know they can rely on the evidence that you've developed in preclinical studies. Really what GLP is, is just showing that a facility has the appropriate SOPs, training, uh, controls, things like that, so that people can rely on the evidence that comes out of them. And Similarly, similarly, GMP, good manufacturing pra practices. Um, this is really difficult for some people to understand. The um, Division Five clinical trial applications in Canada says that you need to meet Division Two, which is good manufacturing practices. So in short, anything that's going to go into people needs to meet principles of good manufacturing practices, except for three things I think that are exempt uh, for clinical trials, and that's all to deal with sample retention. So really, you need to be GMP. The question becomes how GMP? And, and you need to be fully GMP by the time you're ready for a new drug submission. So later stage trials will need to be more GMP than early stage trials. And this is a sliding scale of flexibility and in interpretation. So when you know more about your product, you're expected to control more. And earlier, when you don't know as much, there's more flexibility in how GMP is interpreted. And then finally, the last question that I get a lot, and then I'll, I'll be happy to answer some of yours, is what special pathways exist? Um, the FDA has, does a really good job uh, labeling and structuring different pathways, like breakthrough designation, things like that. So I'm not talking about them in Canada because I'm Canadian and because I want um, to stand up for Canada and say, while they're not very good at, uh, at labeling special pathways and do it, they do exist. There, there are mechanisms that, um, can compensate for not having a breakthrough designation. And first of all, Health Canada is very approachable. They're known for being uh, approachable, a world class regulator. They're insightful. Um, so I'd encourage people to uh, engage with them. You don't need to have a designation, a breakthrough designation. You can have a pre pre submission with Health Canada or a pre CTA and get the same feedback. Um, Health Canada is open to novel approaches. So while there's no special pathway that I've mentioned yet, um, the existing pathways do apply. Health Canada does have a priority review pathway. So if you have an unmet medical need, you can justify 
um, having a shorter review period rather than 300 days, it can go down to 180 to get to patients faster. And uh, there's also a conditional approval pathway. And sorry about the acronym. It's the Notice of Compliance with Conditions Pathway. This is where something has promising clinical efficacy, complete clinical safety data, but they're willing to look at products earlier in development. So you get some of the same benefits of what you get from the uh, different designations you get elsewhere. So uh, I think that's what I had planned ahead of time and prepared. I'm happy to answer questions. Uh, please do have a look at our website if you're interested in knowing more about We Can Reg or connecting with us. I have some of the resources are on that website as well. A uh, good way to engage is to simply ask us a question. Start now and then we can have a follow-up dialogue and hopefully I can help you solve uh, commercialization problems using my regulatory experience and, and tools and things like that. And you can always email me uh, and I have my email address here. So I guess I will end it there and stop sharing my screen and see um, if you're still interested in asking some uh, some questions of me. Well, thank you very much, Patrick. Of course, we are uh, very interested in asking questions. That was a fantastic talk. Uh, so I'll let you uh, take a breath, and then uh, I'll just wanted to uh, let everyone know that. Uh, 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 thank you, Human. So uh, our next speaker is uh, Dr. Uh, Peter Zanstra, uh, the Director of School of Bi Medical Engineering uh, at the University of uh, British Columbia and the Director of Michael Smith Lab uh, Laboratories, uh, also at the University of uh, British Columbia and a Canada researcher in stem cell bioengineering. Uh, uh, so Dr. Zanstra has a lot of uh, experience in commercialization uh, of different technologies, mostly cell-based uh, technologies. Uh, so, and then uh, also, uh, don't forget to follow us on on uh, our uh, Twitter account. Uh, you will get the most up-to-date information uh, through this uh, account. Uh, also, feel free to contact me and and uh, Human uh, via email if you have any questions, uh, comments, uh, suggestions. Uh, for this, uh, for these e-seminar series. Also, uh, I would like to thank our um, uh, sponsor, uh, Montreal Transmed Tech, who has been with us since almost the beginning of these e-seminar series. Uh, we couldn't do this without their help. Uh, we appreciate and acknowledge their support. So with that, uh, I would like to uh, start with questions. Uh, if you have anyone in the in the audience, if you have any questions, feel free to uh, to ask in the Q and A box. If you don't, then I will ask most of the questions. So uh, I want to give you a chance to uh, to ask your questions from the uh, from the uh, speaker. It was it was a very interesting talk, uh, and then to be honest, Patrick answered half of my questions. So uh, uh, so what I had many. So, uh, uh, so the first question is uh, uh, from Malguraza. I hope I pronounce your name, uh, uh, Malguraza, Malguraza. I'm sorry, <laughs> properly. I apologize. Uh, so, uh, so the question is about uh, IP protection. So. Uh, what she asks is that IP protection is very important part of the regulatory pathway, uh, and then uh, and then we are all fully aware of the importance of this step for the technology transfer. However, at the same time, uh, uh, we're wondering how fair or ethical it actually is to patent uh, uh, the research outcome or a discovery that was actually funded by the taxpayers, meaning the society. Uh, so do you have any comments uh, about this, this question? Yeah, yeah, it's a, it's a good question. And I'm, I'm going to, um, I, I'm gonna split it up a little bit. So I'm, I'm not a patent expert, um, but I think this is a great question and, and it does definitely um, bleed into uh, regulatory um, frameworks and, and requirements. So first, there's there's two concepts for uh, protecting um, protecting things that are going through a regulatory uh, pathway. One is patents, and the other is data protection and market exclusivity. Patents are are managed and regulated through um, Industry Canada, or what's now I think uh, the acronym is ICED, 
Um, and so that that's one thing. And I, I, I don't, I have personal um, preferences and, and thoughts about that. And I think I probably agree with uh, some of the audience um, about the use of patents and how they're, how they function and some of the, the, the existing problems that could probably be improved on, but I'm not going to comment on those. Instead, I'm going to talk and, and shift it over to data protection. That is uh, a more of a regulatory, um, more of a regulatory concept. Data protection and market exclusivity are found in Division 8 of the Food and Drug Regulation. So that's part of when you file a new drug submission. You're guaranteed to have six years of um, protection against having someone use your product as a Canadian reference product. So they cannot say, well, the, essentially you can't develop a generic or a biosimilar, and I know because I worked on biosimilars, for six years, you can't submit a, uh, a new drug submission that references someone else's product. Um, and that reflects the period of time that's expected to be needed to recover some of the additional um, investments you've had, whether you've discovered it or not, and that was done before, and that's part of your ethical argument, I under understand. But from first in human studies to market authorization, you invest billions of dollars. So um, that the length of it is interesting. Um, I'm not going to get into that, but just to specify, that's that's what the six years data protection is. And then even if you file a submission, it won't get a notice of compliance and approved until eight years have expired from when the original one had its, um, had its uh, approval. Now, um, the, the patent linkage is interesting because the patented medicine notice of compliance also allows somebody to make sure nobody infringes on their patent and gets on the market and then you get a messy legal situation. So that's the function there. And a final thing is a certificate of supplementary protection. So when you get approved, if you come to Canada very soon after having your first global approval, you can get up to two more years of patent protection. So all of this is to say, um, these exist to protect investments and allow people who uh, invest in the high risk of drug development to, um, to recover some benefit for that. There has to be, I guess, the, the agreement that when this was written was that there has to be an incentive to invest high risk money in this space. Um, it, it's, it's a really, really difficult um, thing to address. And there are, what I'll, what I'll do instead of answering directly, because it's just my personal preference to say, there are a lot of people with your thoughts out there right now, suggesting there's better ways to do this. There's also, um, uh, pricing restrict restrictions for anybody who has a patent so that they can't price gouge uh, patients. And, and that's um, that's just being revised recently to hopefully bring the, the high cost of medicines that, as you say, some of, the, some of them have, have been developed with um, public money. Uh, so there's a lot going on in the space right now. I don't know where it's going, um, but I think there's a recognition of the problems that you raise and there's no clear answer yet. And I don't think that a lot of people um, agree on, on the direction it's going, um, there's always the argument that it's going to impede innovation and have less investment. So I, I can I can talk around it all day, but I, I don't have an answer. I just wanted to volunteer some additional uh, regulatory thoughts. Well, thank you, thank you, Patrick. I, I just wanted to add a quick note, and I think uh, Chris Flores from uh, from uh, uh, University of Victoria Tech Transfer Unit is also on the on this uh, on this call. One thing uh, that uh, that I think uh, is is uh, we need to pay attention to is that most of the universities they own the IP, uh, so the research the app the any patent that that is an outcome of a research will first go to universities and then they own the IP, and then they have of course uh, 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 like some arrangement with with the with the inventors, but eventually uh, with that arrangement uh, the. Uh, any outcome or any benefits, financial benefits that will be the outcome of those IPs will eventually, to some extent, goes back to the uh, to the university. So that, but again, I'm uh, uh, we have experts in in IP uh, protection and universities and tech transfer transfer units and then other units and then other institutions that can answer this question uh, better than me. But that was a fantastic question. So another question uh, 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 from. Uh, the same participant is, which was my third question actually, uh, is that, uh, is it feasible? That's about uh, replacing or reducing the number of animals in the studies. And then uh, it's about the, the feasibility of using 
uh, adequate in vitro model, humanized models such as bioprinted models, organs and chip models, organized models. Um, to uh, uh, I mean, I mean, uh, is it feasible that these kinds of in vitro models will completely replace the animal models uh, for uh, uh, trials, basically for preclinical pre trials and medical uh, product evaluation? Uh, what is your uh, what are your thoughts and then what do you think the uh, uh, regulatory body's position on these kinds of uh, models it's, it's another good question and, and i think uh, i say that because a lot of people have these questions the technology is changing quickly um for how to assess and and what kind of models are being developed and um the cell and gene therapies that are being developed um the animal models arguably aren't always that predictive of the human experience. So there's definitely a drive and an interest to replace some of the animal models with some of these new technologies. Um, I don't see us being there yet. I think um, the regulators open to seeing new models and new combinations. That's why I said it's really not an animal model. It's a, it's the company, it's up to the company to say, look, here's the risks that we've identified here's how we've addressed and informed them. So here's our rationale for why that should be adequate. And it's up to the companies to say, uh, or companies or researchers or whoever to say, this, um, this new technology um, should replace these other ones. I suspect in the short term, because um, in the absence of regulatory, in the absence of scientific certainty, there's a precautionary principle that's applied. So you might have to do both in an early study and pave the way, and maybe a later study that you do might rely on on a, a non-animal model uh, of disease. Um, so regulators, I think, are open to it. I think they'll approach this cautiously. Um, and all I will add is there are other forms of evidence that are also being considered, like real-world evidence, um, and all of these things will all factor together. Um, and, and the way to think about it is how can we make the regulator feel comfortable in accepting that the evidence you've, you've provided addresses the potential risks so you can have some informed patients um, choose whether to partic participate in the trial or not. Um, and that will continue to evolve, um, but it will take a bit of time. Uh, oh, can you hear me? Okay, I see. Uh, I thought that I, I, I'm muted. So I see this is this is very good. Uh, that's that's promising uh, because eventually uh, I see that there is a trend in in, in, uh, uh, in Europe and then also in the in Canada and in the states to reduce the number of animals and then rely more on on uh, more biomimetic in vitro models such as those that I mentioned, organ, organized 3D bioprinted models and uh, organs and a chip. But, but again, I mean, those animal models are already, you know, there are standard animal models that are accepted by the regulatory approvals. And there is, uh, uh, and then, uh, well, I mean, uh, it's good that to hear that the Re Health Canada and other regulatory bodies are receptive. They are, uh, they acknowledge that these models are, uh, are to some extent they can be used uh, uh, with animal models to support the uh, uh, to evaluate the safety and also performance of the different drugs. So uh, uh, along the same direction, uh, and then uh, it's it's uh, uh, you mentioned that it's it's up to uh, up to the researchers or up to the companies start, like uh, those who develop different uh, to develop drugs is to convince the regulatory uh, bodies. Uh, 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 to that that this drug is fair safe and then second it's it's uh, uh, it's it performs as it's supposed to and in the claims uh, so there's a claim there that uh, that uh, that you submit to to the to health Canada for example uh, there are two uh, like a sets of claims that you you, uh, you submit how much published data previous data uh, uh, by others can be used. So we, we put together a document, you have some data from your own lab, you have some data from like, uh, like you perform some studies in, in a GLP facility, uh, but there are some other data. So, uh, I mean, uh, the company, from the company side, you want to do as less as possible, right? Because that saves money. Uh, but regulatory uh, bodies, Health Canada requires a lot of information as uh, many uh, data, as much data as possible from, from, from the companies to support their claims. 
so part of this data could be from literature from the literature how much how important what is what is you know uh, 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 you know how much of published data we can use to support these these kinds of things. yeah it, in short most of the time what i see is the published literature provides context it um it can be used to say this makes sense compared to what others have used, but a lot of times it's not going to be directly relevant unless you're able to draw it into relevance um, with additional data. So it's just like what you do with um, biosimilars. You can't just rely on the fact that someone else has approved and then show that your product, uh, or, and then and then say you have, should have the same indications because, for example, if you're a growth hormone, another growth hormone can't just say, well, that's what they did. Um, you have to develop your own product. And if you want to rely on some of the clinical data from another product, uh, you have to do what's called the comparability study. Um, and that comparability study will draw into relevance um, some other information. Uh, most of the time, if it's in the published literature, you don't know enough about it to say that your product's similar enough to rely on any evidence they've had. What you can do is say, I've started about this many cells and I've shown that it has this kind of effect and, and it should, this is the right dose. This is in the ballpark of what others have done in a whole bunch of other studies that, as shown by this meta-analysis. So we're probably not way out with our data. So it's, it's that kind of thing. Um, the direct relevance of the literature is pretty low unless you can provide a rationale and support it with evidence. Um, yeah, it, it's, it's essentially, um, you need to do the research, you need to read it, you need to understand it, but it's not like you and, and, and if you reference it in your submission, you'll you'll need to provide the the, the publication. Um, but it's not like it's usually direct um, evidence to support your product. Does that answer your question? Uh, yes, yes, you answered my question uh, perfectly. Thank you very much. Uh, and again, I mean, we had this. I mean, the reason I ask it because because we had a personal experience, and we can maybe uh, maybe talk about this uh, at another time. Um, uh, so the next question is is from Sena, and uh, and I think they are from from Turkey, uh, and it's 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 a uh, very similar to the question that I have uh, actually. Uh, uh, so uh, what I'm what I'm going to do is I'll uh, say I'm going to ask my question first and then I'll get into your question because mine is you know I think I think it's very relevant to to what you're going to ask. Uh, so my question is how much obtaining regulatory approvals in other jurisdiction, uh, you know, expedite the process in in Canada. So let's say you get uh, CE mark or you go in Europe you get the approvals. Or you get even even better, and uh, you get the FDA approval, and then you come with this approval to Health Canada. So, how much does that help with the process? Yeah, it's a good question. I should add that to my frequently added questions. I think it, it makes perfect sense, and it's natural that you ask it. So, thank you for uh, the opportunity to answer that. that. In short, the timelines are no different. If you get approved in the FDA and you get approved by the European Medicines Association and you file a new drug submission with Health Canada um, and it's not a priority review, your target performance standard remains 300 days. Um, so, And same with a clinical trial application, the target remains 30 days, even if you've been approved by another jurisdiction. Um, Health Canada is a standalone regulator, so they don't um, rely on other submissions. So they will regulate it and they will look at all the data that you provide. Um, with that being said, they have harmonized with other regulators for a reason. Um, they have ongoing meetings with FDA, EMA, and Japanese PMDA for cell and gene therapies every three months. And they talk about their emerging policies and uh, emerging uh, submission issues, and they make sure they're aligned on them. Uh, from that perspective, if a regulator if a company or a researcher has an IND that's approved um, and they file a CTA to Health Canada, Health Canada, if you talk to them about it and say, well, we filed here and they've addressed all of, our, we've addressed all their issues, so we should be fine here. If you say that in a pre-submission meeting, they will say, can you show me their review minute, their review notes and, and things like that. So they want to consider what other regulators have and in which case your answers to them, they'll look over. I think it does predispose them to say, well, if they're okay with it, maybe we should be, but that's not a rule. They will do their own review. They will differ from other regulators. They'll pride themselves on it sometimes if they catch a risk and, and help to address things. So um, it doesn't change the timelines. Uh, it, 
they they harmonize, so they should come up with similar issues, but they're not afraid to um, to differ. I guess is is what I'm what I'm saying, and uh, and I, I think that that's actually a really important point, and why you should plan to have a pre submission meeting with Health Canada, even if you've been successful in the U.S. or in the EU, because you'll get to know the other regulators and some of their pet issues, and um, and I think they there are some initiatives for. Uh, Health Canada to explore working with other regulators. They work closely with uh, TGA Singapore uh, and and yeah, there's a an ACSS. I forget the, but they they are starting to work with other regulators, and some of them have um, unique ways of of dividing up the submission. But Health Canada is still a standalone uh, regulator. I see. Okay, good to know. Uh, so Senna, I think I think that's uh, partly answered your questions from from uh, our side, uh, like I mean, in Canada side. But in Turkey, it's interesting. So in Turkey, Sena, what Sena says is that uh, even if you have a detailed file, the inspections take uh, too long, sometimes up to a year or two. Uh, so when you simultaneously submit the same product uh, to the FDA for approval and uh, receive the approval, then the process in Turkey uh, becomes expedited uh, so this is this is a little bit different in in turkey as compared to canada so what i was uh what i was going to ask is that uh so so you submit the application to health canada so it takes uh 300 days to review and they usually come back with with comments is that is that true and then you have to go through another round of maybe just changing things or or that's that's just uh the, yeah, i've no, never done that so that's why i'm no, asking no no problem i can clarify there's a few things that i can say here i think based on senna's question first i want to clarify um health canada will review the drug submission that's part of the new drug submission and the the ultimate goal is to get a notice of compliance and that's what takes 300 days um during that review for biologics Health Canada can do what's called an on-site evaluation. That's part of that review. The scientific reviewers will say, you say you manufacture like this, 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 and that. I need to see your facility. I need to see. So, but that's all factored into the 300 days. That won't extend your um, drug submission review. It's still 300 days. They will coordinate it. You should tell them your manufacturing schedule ahead of time and they'll come and have a look. Um, the other thing you've mentioned is uh, how can it be extended? Can it be extended because you have to, so it's different than Europe. In Europe, you have uh, your, your uh, review period one, and then they have a, a, a hold, and then they ask you a whole bunch of questions, wait till you respond, and then resume the, the, the review clock. It's not like that in Canada. In Canada, you have your submission at 300 days. When they ask you for additional information, and I should clarify, you can't add new information to a new drug submission you can only clarify what's already there. So when they ask you about your information, they'll give you a, 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 a deadline for responding to them. That's independent of the review clock as well. So they'll typically say at the beginning of a new drug submission and up to like a month before their, their target performance standard, they'll say you have 15 days to get back and answer our questions. That's again, it's independent. It's not gonna take away from their 300 day. Um, in a clinical trial application, you have two days and it's called the Clarifax um, re request or an information request that used, both terms are used. Um, so those don't affect the decision. You know, when you file a CPA, you'll get your decision in 30 days. If they have a huge problem and there's a problem with your data, they can say, we're not approving this. You need to wait until we address this issue. So that's possible. I don't think it happens very often. Similarly, in a new drug submission, and this is a new thing, there's what's called a stop clock. Um, and that's usually within the last few weeks of uh, approval. Um, when you're negotiating your product monograph and they submit information to you and the company's taking a long time to get back to them and can't meet their Clarifax or information request deadlines, they can do a stop clock to extend it a bit. That's brand new. I don't know how often it's being used, but I think you can pretty much rely on your decision in 300 days. And the only other thing I'll add to that for the timeline is, remember I said there's a new drug submission, but there's also your facility uh, application, the establishment mm -hmm. license application. That takes 250 days. And that's done mm -hmm. by a different group that's a GMP expert, and you would coordinate with them. Typically that's filed, and for small molecules, that's definitely filed more than 90 days before your new drug submission. So that you don't get into a situation where the regulator approves your drug, 
but you can't manufacture and distribute it to Canadians because you don't have a facility that's been licensed. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. that's a different situation, but, uh, and I know a little bit less about the 250 days and what goes on, but I think that should be filed before you need drug submissions to so really, you're not waiting to, to get your approval on any of these, you're really just scheduling it. And if you have all the right information, it should be allowed um, to move forward. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Very, very nice, very nice. Uh, it's good, good information. Uh, and then again, I mean, I mean, uh, Patrick, you uh, answered most of my questions uh, uh, during your talk. When I was just watching your, your slides and uh, listening to you, you were just answering the question. I was just crossing all the questions. So I'll let, I have a few questions uh, left, but I let uh, Human uh, ask any questions that he may have. Uh, I see in his eyes that he is, he has a few questions. So I'll let him ask and then I'll come back and then with, with my questions if you have time. Thank you, Mohsen. Thank you, Patrick, uh, for answering our question. I have a little bit of different question uh, from, but it's in line with your expertise. Uh, since we have uh, graduate students and, uh, you know, uh, in, in the audience, they might uh, want to take the path that you, you took uh, to become a regulatory after, uh, officer or agent. So what, uh, I mean, what, quality or what degree or what competency they should have or uh, is there any academic path they have to take or is it experience based you know can you just uh, shed light on this uh, for for graduate yeah students? i'd be happy to you know? I've, I've spoken with a lot of students and and i think it, it really isn't clear and there's no no definitive path and and that's that's kind of nice um i'm lucky because i have a multidisciplinary background i have no idea what else to do and really one thing I think you have to be really good at is putting di together different perspectives and understanding implications and how to fit them together. So it goes back to being able to understand science, being able to understand clinical, being able to communicate in writing and put it together and uh, to problem solve. Those are the key skills I think you need. Um, and so I think it's, it's great if you have a science background, if you have a PhD, that's wonderful. You're doing better than, than me when I started. Um, and, and, uh, and, and so as far as paths and academic um, activities, there are um, uh, certificates, uh, college certificates you can get in regulatory affairs. So that's one thing. There's a master's in regulatory affairs. I was on an advisory board for North, Northeastern University that offers that in, in Toronto and, and places in, in the US. Um, so there are academic paths that can help you. There's also professional paths. So if you, my biggest recommendation is if you're interested, Find a PI who's doing something who doesn't know a lot about this, or even if they do, great. Do some reading, offer to help, start writing documents. That's the best experience to start solving problems. And the only way you can do that is to say, how can I help you? They'll say, I don't know. And then you can go and look at a guidance document and start reading and say, you're gonna need this. Oh, well, what does that look like? And then you start writing it for them. So that kind of experience is wonderful. And then over time, as you get a bit more experience, you A, can say you have that experience when you find a regulatory role that you want to fill. You can rely on your science background to help get you that role as well. And then I think you can uh, write a test for a, called the Regulatory Affairs Certificate that requires either some in-class training and experience or some combination of the two. And that really is setting a bar just to say, you've met a certain minimum standard and have a general knowledge of how drug regulations, device regulations, pricing regulations, all these things fit together. And um, there's uh, textbooks, like if you're writing uh, uh, any kind of other exam, the MCATs, the GMATs, things like that, but it's just for the Regulatory Affairs Certificate. And that's put out by the Regulatory Affairs Professional Society. So you could start looking at that. I mean, I have uh, an old version right here, and it, uh, it's Canadian uh, Regulatory Affairs Fundamentals. So things like that are good places to start. Although I think uh, the wraps just recently um, went to, uh, I don't know if they have jurisdictional ones anymore. There's an international, there might be a US, I don't know if there's a Canada specific one anymore. Um, but I encourage anybody who's interested, like honestly, there's no real barrier to it except for how useful you are and how you can start putting together things. And then it's networking and finding people who have the need. Um, the different paths you might go, you can go and be part of a company, you can be part of an emerging startup, you can be an academic, you can be a consultant. There's lots of different, uh, areas and I don't see this um, need to go away. There's so many people with such good scientific ideas and they don't know what to do with it. Um, so I'd encourage anyone, if you, if you like science, you like communication, you like 
uh, problem solving, get into it. Thank you so much. So it means that the, the job market or the job perspective is quite vast. You can go to different, you know, paths as consultant, as the regulatory agent, and even you can have your yeah. own company like you. So, so yeah. So Mohsen, uh, please go ahead. Sure, I don't sure. have any other questions. Uh, well, Thank I you have for... one last question, which was, uh, as you know, we have our own startup and then we are, we were during the, I mean, it's, it's a medical device. It's not a drug uh, startup, but we were in, in the process. And then, uh, I mean, as a researcher, I had no experience with, with regulatory approval and, uh, and uh, things like this. Uh, so I usually rely on, I mean, we rely on experts and, and the regulatory experts, such as consultants, uh, clinical trial experts, and uh, so on and so forth. Uh, so as someone who has uh, this consulting firm, so you communicate with us a lot. Uh, so you t you said, when when is a good time to think about clinical trial uh, uh, in the process? And you had this nice process, uh, I, mean, I mean, schematic that shows all the steps that you need to go through. Uh, through the process. But when I want to, let's say, in, in a hypothetical uh, situation, scenario, I want to contact you. When is a good time to contact you? When do you expect us to come to you and then talk to you about the the regulatory process? What stage of the process, uh, product development, uh, you want us to be before we contact you? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question, and thanks, because it'll it'll encourage people, hopefully, to reach out. But um, really, there's no wrong time. I'm suggesting a lot of people wait until you want to have a, an interaction with the regulator, and that's a very clear way. If you ever want to speak with a regulator, I would suggest re speaking with a regulatory expert first, because they will help you prepare and, and to improve your questions and to make sure that you start a good relationship with the regulator. It's not necessary, but that's the clearest time. I'm saying going before is helpful um, because, for example, if you are done, once you're done your proof of concept studies and you know you have something that you're going to pursue and you're going to plan trial enabling preclinical studies, I think that's a good touch base point. Um, and the best springboard to talking with a regulatory consultant is to have a question. If you have a question, should I use this animal model? How many animals should I use? How long should this study be? Does this have to be GLP? Um, is this study necessary? Um, I'm thinking of be, having this indication in the long term and I'm trying to justify all these investments right now. What's your regulatory perspective? Those are good questions that can start a conversation. And those are free questions and you should always have be able to have a, a productive conversation with somebody before you have to pay them anything. And, and, and that would be, um, that's why I'm encouraging people to reach out and have a question it is, um, if you ask me that question, I can think about it. I can give you a regulatory perspective. I can say, look, you really should do these things and I can help. And then, but then laying that out for you, you've got information, you've got some value from the conversation in the first place. Um, you have an understanding of what it is I'm proposing and you, and you know why it's necessary. And I should be able to tell you roughly how long it'll take, which will also in, and um, let you know roughly how much it would cost. And those are, are great ways to start a conversation. So just in short, do it before you do, um, after you do proof of concept, otherwise you, you should be focused on the science. Um, do it before you do expensive GLP studies because mm -hmm. you can get some useful insights and save yourself some money or maybe, uh, right? And, and, um, and definitely by the time you wanna interact with a regulator and, and just make sure if, if you have a question, reach out. Those are uh, general rules, I guess. Well, thank you very much. We are running out of time. I just have one quick question. Sorry, guys. Uh, one, how many pre-submission uh, meetings can we have with uh, with Health Canada? Because it's That's free, it. right? And my understanding is that it's it's a free consulting. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Um, it's a it's a difficult one to answer because uh, it's not written in policy. Health Canada doesn't say how many you can have. The management of drug submissions guidance that spells it out for Canada um, says what the process is, and really. Um, the process allows Health Canada to weed out people who don't don't have additional new questions to talk about. So they're not unlimited. The judgment is, will it be a productive meeting? Um, typically, there's one or two. There's either one pre-CTA and you ask your best questions. So you do want to make sure you're prepared. It is possible to have what 
people informally call a pre-pre-CTA. That's because there's a pre-pre-IND in the US, so they just apply the same idea. They follow the same process. One's typically before your um, your your GLP studies. One is, and I, I should have thrown the slide in, I was thinking about it to describe this, but that's the pre-pre, and then the other one is right before you file your CTA. So there's typically one or two, but by policy, it's just, when you have new issues that require a discussion with Health Canada, and they'll judge whether it's going to be useful. If it's not going to be useful, you could just get a written response or a rejection and say, we've already talked to you, so um, we don't see a benefit in this meeting. It's the polite way in Canada to say, you don't get another meeting. You don't have enough uh, juicy stuff to discuss. <laughs> well, thank you very much, Patrick. It was, it was a very informative uh, talk and presentation. Uh, I learned a lot myself. Uh, again, as I mentioned, I'm in, the, in this process, and then there's a lot to learn. Uh, uh, and then I also would like to thank the, uh, the participants for uh, for attending this. Uh, this talk. I hope this uh, talk was uh, also uh, useful to them. Uh, so with that, uh, I would like to end this uh, uh, session today, and then wish you a great day or night ahead. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Have a great Bye -bye. day. Take care.